Swim Things in Blue Springs, your one-stop shop for all things swim. Pools, spas, patio furniture, swimwear, and accessories. Visit them in Blue Springs or at www.swimthings.com. I broke a woman named Caroline Bruce's record, who was a 2004 Olympian, I think. Um, and everybody else, it was a private school record. So everybody else, like the 100 Butterfly or the 100 Backstroke or whatever, they had all gone on. It was like Natalie Coughlin and Kathleen Hersey. They all gone on to become Olympians. Um, and so when I broke that record, I, I kind of felt like it, it did feel, it was a great feeling, but I also felt this immense pressure of like, wow, literally every other name on this list you know, has gone on to, to, you know, to these goals. Um, you know, I have to do that now too. And of course, Welcome to The Journey. I'm Jeff Cummings, joined by my co-host, Molly Harmon. And today's guest had a stellar swimming career as one of the fastest high school swimmers in history, followed by four solid years at my alma mater, the University of Texas. After she retired from swimming, she sort of fell off the radar, as many do, but she's back in the spotlight, almost literally, as a writer on a major Hollywood TV show. And it's our pleasure to have her here today. I'm so excited to talk with her. Let's welcome Spindrift back to the show. Hi, Spindrift. How are you? Hi, Molly. Hi, Jeff. Thank you guys so much. That was a killer intro. <laughs> I would like to be introduced like that always, just walking into any room. <laughs> I can do that for you. <laughs> so my first question to you is probably a first question everyone asks you, but what is the meaning of the name Spindrift? The name, yes. Um, People always ask if I'm like sick of getting the question and the answer is never. I always love talking about my name unless I'm like at Starbucks or like on the phone with customer service <laughs> where I just like go by a fake name. But um, so my spindrift is a, is a noun um, in the ocean on like a really windy or blustery day. It's a very thin sea spray that'll blow backwards off of an ocean wave. And um, there's like a lot of, it's like a nautical term and there's like hotels up and down the coast named that. And uh, my aunt was named Pamela. Um, she was born in Dallas, Texas in the 60s or the 50s, I guess, but she was sort of a flower child and, you know, marched to the beat of her own drum. And she read the word spindrift in a poem when she was 16, I think, and got her dad to take her down to the Dallas County Courthouse and legally change her name from Pamela to spindrift. Um, and for a long time, it was just her. And I think I was supposed to be named Lucy, which is the name of my mom's sister, but there was some last minute argument in the hospital room when I was born and um, they decided to name me after her. So that's the story. Um, I go by spin just because it's easier um, usually, but I always say I'm going to like, it feels weird to be, I'm almost 30, like almost 30 and going by spin. So I'm always saying I'll change to spin drift someday, but <laughs> it was helpful on deck back in the day because I could know, not that like a ton of people knew who I was, far from it, but like, if someone will come up to me and say, hey, Spindrift, I would know like, oh, this is someone who's like seen my name in the heat sheet or something, as opposed to like, hey, Spin, I was like, yeah. <laughs> so your parents have fairly ordinary names, Peter and Nancy. Is there anyone else in your family um, with an unusual name like yours? Good research. <laughs> um, they'll be happy to get a shout out. No, not, well, um, my brother's name is John, so that's pretty boring. I do have a couple of um, aunts named Kalita and there's, um, I have an aunt named Fluffy. So there's some sort of different names on my dad's side of the family, but yeah. I like that, Aunt Fluffy. <laughs> that is fun, I love that. I think that is a nickname as well, but she goes by that, you know, everyone calls her that. So yeah, kind of, um, but my mom's side is much more normal and boring. So it kind of evens out. Well, I really hope you weren't teased about the name Spindrift because it's, it's really one of the best names I have ever heard. Thank you. I agree. And it's, it's, there's, there were a couple great like age group, especially in Texas, like swimming names. When I was swimming in Texas, there was Nuffy Swanson, um, whose real name was enough. Um, and there's a swimmer who just, I think she's still swimming at Texas remedy rule, just like the coolest name ever. So I feel like we would always like see each other on deck and be like, cool name club. <laughs> 
And now we're going to see your name on TV starting in January 2021. This is so exciting. You're a writer for the CBS show FBI Most Wanted. So uh, I've seen the show and I really like it. And just as a quick synopsis for those who haven't seen it, the show follows FBI agents who track down people on the FBI's Most Wanted list. Uh, so tell us about the episode that your your debut episode that's going to be premiering in January. Um, well, it's kind of annoying, like, I don't know how much I can or should say, but um, I wrote what's going to be the fourth episode this season, um, which I think should air in January. And um, the show is fantastic. I came in um, to the second season as a writer. So it's had a full season before. It's a Dick Wolf show, which is like such a pinch me thing for me because I was always watching like Law and Order, Law and Order SVU, usually between prelims and finals. Honestly, I feel like that's what we all do, right? It's like, post up and watch TNT. So to have this be, this is my first like paid TV writing job to have this be it is, is really a dream. Um, and it's a great group of writers and, um, we've been meeting over zoom and, <laughs> um, so I don't know how much I can say about my actual episode, but it airs Tuesdays at 10, nine central. And, um, they're actually shooting mine as we speak, we're in production. So it's been like a total whirlwind and super fun. Well, I just want to know real quick, is it just, were you the solo writer or was it a team of writers in this episode? Well, it's always a team. A team writing is sort of interesting. People don't know a lot about it. Uh, film writing is, you know, tends to be sort of more of like a solo activity and TV writing is very like group project vibes in a good way. <laughs> um, so there's always, usually it'll change depending on the show, but usually there's a writer's room assembled. Our room has about 10 people and we all collaborate in terms of um, like major plot arcs. Um, it sort of depends too on if your show is a procedural or if it's serialized. The show is procedural, meaning that there's a new case of the week every week. So theoretically you can sort of tune in at any time and kind of catch up and, and know what's going on. So I am the credited sole writer of my episode, but it certainly um, wasn't just me alone in a room writing it. Um, it, it goes through drafts and the, the showrunner looks at it and the network looks at it and um, gives notes. And so it's a very collaborative process, um, which I enjoy. Where do you think some of your imagination comes from um, to write like very serious and almost scary situations? I've always been very curious how people come up with situations like that. Right. I, yeah. I, 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 if you asked me if I was going to be on a show about the FBI, I would say definitely not. I'm more of a like dramedy writer by trade, but um, so I've been learning too about how to write the, the sort of scary. I honestly think um, a lot of it comes from laps in the pool. I mean, we, you guys both know, like on a, you know, 10,000 yard main set, what do you have to do, but think. <laughs> and I was always, um, I knew I wanted to be a writer from a really young age, even beyond swimming. I always kind of knew like my swimming career is going to end and, and I'm going to try to write. Um, so I think I was always kind of writing little stories in my head and just kind of getting into like fake arguments <laughs> with people while I swam. Like just, you know how it is. It's just that endless sort of monotony and anything to kind of keep that at bay. So a lot of it did come from the pool, to be honest with you. And did you use like any personalities from people you swam with or people you went to school with that you integrated into a storyline? Um, on this show, not really. Um, pretty much everybody on the show that's not like a main cast member that's already kind of has been written um, are, you know, bad guys. <laughs> Although I did sort of like try to name some characters vaguely after some friends uh, as little homages, but um, but on projects I work on independently, um, I am developing another project right now. And um, I definitely took, um, took you know, yeah, I mean, you always write from your life experience, right? Even if you're not writing about your life experience. So I took um, attributes of friends and family and situations I've been through. And I sometimes feel a little bit unoriginal, frankly, because I do that a lot. Um, and I, I sometimes am like, you know, I tend to sort of in social gatherings kind of sometimes sit back and observe and um, now I get paid to do that. So <laughs> it feels like cheating a little bit, but yeah, I do that all the time for sure. And working with show business and stars, do you ever have like a pinch me moment realizing that you're writing for stars that you see on the TV? That's a great question. I love that question. I, well, on this show, FBI Most Wanted, one of our guest stars is um, Terry O'Quinn. Um, he, uh, play he's a phenomenal actor but I loved him and knew him from Lost where he played John Locke which was sort of the he was the I mean if uh, no one knows who, if people don't know who he is he was the sort of bald um 
amazing <laughs> character on Lost. And um, when they cast him this season, I about died because Lost was like the show that made me really want to become a television writer. So that's been fairly pinch me. Um, hopefully more to come. <laughs> I've never met him or anything. So it's like a, from afar. That's close enough. You're writing for him. Sure. <laughs> You're putting words in his mouth. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> so how does one get into, first of all, just get into Hollywood to get that opportunity to be in a writer's room for a TV show? You know, um, it's funny because there's so many different ways. And I used to get so frustrated because I would sort of listen. There's a lot of great, like, if you know you want to be a TV writer, there's endless, especially now, podcasts and, um, you know, kind of books and, and you know, the internet is this great resource, but nobody seems to have the same one pathway. It's always like, oh, my, you know, dentist nephew's cousin <laughs> hired me on a, you know, as an assistant and then I rose up. And so, um but that is typically the route, not the dentist nephew's cousin route, but like to get in as an assistant, um, which is what I did. I moved out to LA. I retired from swimming in 2013 and I had a fifth year of school. So I finished that and kind of tried to tailor my major toward screenwriting. I wrote a pilot, a TV pilot for my thesis and um, moved out to LA and have had a bunch of different assistant jobs um, as um, a writer's PA on a couple of different shows, which is somebody who, um, basically is an assistant to the writer's room. So those kind of 10 or so people I mentioned before, there's someone in non-COVID times getting them lunches and coffees and kind of maintaining the office. And um, you kind of, it, it's a great job because you're doing sort of menial tasks, but you're getting to be around writers and creators. And um, I got lucky enough to be on some great shows with some awesome, awesome writers who kind of mentored me. And then kind of from there, it snowballs and a writer leaves to go to a show and you follow them. And uh, I became a development assistant for a little while. And then I, um, for about two and a half years, I was an assistant to a wonderful um, writer creator named David Hudgens, who's actually my current boss now on this show. Um, he's written on Parenthood and Friday Night Lights and all these great series. And um, I was his sort of executive personal assistant for about two and a half years. And you're on all the phone calls and listening to all the deals get made and kind of living like I always was like, oh, I'm in an episode of Entourage, <laughs> except like way less glamorous. Um, and you just kind of are writing on the side. I wrote all the time. Um, it was something I had to really hone like a muscle. Even when I didn't feel like writing, I um, try to treat it like swimming, to be honest with you. Like I, I don't want to write today, but I'm going to write 15 minutes. And um, you build up some samples and um, you either hope to, you know, have someone offer to read your work that you've been working with as an assistant, or you hope to get an agent or a manager and sell something. And um, I kind of did it both ways. I was an assistant for a long time and made those connections. And then I, I um, was named to this, um, like, a, um, I won a contest, sort of, and that's how I got my um, entertainment attorney. And from there, my manager, and then was kind of off to the races from there. So that's the long version. <laughs> well, that it, it sometimes it's never just that overnight kind of thing. Everybody talks about that overnight sensation, whether it's a, somebody in front of the camera, or behind the camera. They talk about it's happened overnight, but you just illustrate it really doesn't happen that way. But um, you know, you just have to keep working and a little bit of luck and a little bit of who you know, but you get there. Totally. Yeah, I think it's it's and not to kind of be corny, but since we are on the journey, I will say. I mean, swimming was such a um, it was such a, just a foundation for me. And people always talk about like time management and all these things that sort of supposedly teaches us, or it does teach most people. My time management is terrible, <laughs> but I think what swimming, like why I was maybe, I felt maybe more prepared, um, for this industry than some other friends of mine who kind of dropped out, um, after a few years, you know, being assistants, they were kind of like, I, this isn't really for me. I think swimming just sort of instills that, um, that sense of like, if you want it, and if you, if, you know, this is what you're here to do, you're going to stay in the pool until you get there. You know, it, there's no quitting. <laughs> I think you guys both know. And I think, um, I'm sure a lot of sports instill that in people, but swimming definitely instilled that in me. Um, so I, it was never like, you know, oh, what's my plan B? I mean, again, like you said, Jeff, I was very fortunate to make some connections and, and be able to, you know, financially support myself. I did coach swimming for a couple, couple of months when I first got out to LA and couldn't find a job, but, um, yeah, I think, um, I think something really gave me that sort of inner knowledge of like, I'm meant to be here and I'm going to stay until everybody else knows that. <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully there's going to be a lot of good things that come from this. Uh, more, I'm, I'm sure there is. It's just the beginning. Uh, so as I said in the introduction, you were, you were one of the fastest high school swimmers in the country. You once owned the national high school record 
in the hundred yard breaststroke. One double oh sixty six was your time, and yes. that's very good. But what is even more impressive is in Texas, where swimming is very big. You never lost a high school race. I mean, that's. <laughs> Can you believe you never lost a high school race? I cannot believe it. And I remember one race, it was like, the I think like the second to last race of my senior year, I almost did lose the race. And I, all I could think was like, oh my God, not after four years, am I going to lose this like hundred butterfly <laughs> in Katy, <laughs> Texas? I cannot let it happen. Um, yeah, it was, uh, I loved, I loved swimming in high school. I mean, I, I you know, sort of arguably peaked <laughs> then and there's, you know, kind of good and bad to that. Um, but I, um, yeah, it's, it's so strange to look back on now because it does in some senses feel like a whole other lifetime. Um, and then obviously at the same time, as I think you both know, I always will identify as a swimmer. Um, and, um, so yeah, I'm very proud. Th amazing. I mean, your research is unparalleled guys, <laughs> but yeah, I'm very proud of that. I'm very proud of that record for sure. It, I, it definitely got smashed years ago, but it was, it was very cool for me. What memories do you have of that day you set that national record? Oh gosh, I remember it really well, actually. It was cool because it was at my home pool in Dallas um, uh, where I trained um, from like age eight on. And so um, it was, yeah, just a morning high school meet. And um, I don't even think I, I didn't wear legs. I was kind of on the tail end of, of like, I was doing the whole Megan Gendrick thing. Like back in like 2007, 2008, a lot of breaststrokers wouldn't wear leg suits. Um, because we thought that, I don't know, they would like not let us catch the water or something. So I was just in like a normal fast skin. Um, and, uh, yeah, I remember the race feeling like, um, like nothing, how the races sometimes do. You just like, aren't even in pain and you touch and you're like, I, that took, you know, that either took two seconds or two years. I don't know which, um, and I didn't know I'd gotten the record for a while because it, it wasn't really on my radar. So I just was happy with the time. Um, and went home and I can't remember. And I think maybe someone told me or a few days later, I found out that I'd broken it. Um, yeah, I remember it really well. And I'm sure that one minute barrier was on your mind a little bit. It was, I was, I always wanted to break it. I always wanted to go 59. I never did. That ended up being the fastest I ever went, um, which is bittersweet for sure. Um, it's that cool thing, as you know, Jeff, maybe the, the breaststroke thing of like, you know, you you're already going to be breaking a minute in the other three strokes, most likely. So breaking a minute in breaststroke means you've broken it in all four um, hundreds. So that was always like my big goal. And I, I fell short of it, but um, God, maybe <laughs> I almost said maybe someday, not maybe someday, but <laughs> in my dreams, I'll break it. <laughs> so in your four years at Texas, you experienced what a lot of college swimmers go through. Um, you didn't improve your best times, which in your case was the hundred breaststroke looking back now, do you, what do you attribute to that? You know, um, I had a lot of injuries, um, in that really cropped up later in my swimming career, I guess, um, definitely in college. Um, I think, um, I didn't, you know, I had a first, I had a rough first couple of years. I loved swimming in Texas and most of my teammates are still my dearest friends to this day. Um, but, um, you know, it was tough. I think I had sort of been like a big fish in a little pond at home, to be totally frank, if I'm being really honest with myself. And I think getting on a bigger stage was a little jarring for me um, and something I had to sort of learn. I was always very much a meat swimmer. And I got to Texas and I'm swimming next to like Kathleen Hersey over here and Carly Bispo over here and Eddie's coaching the boys over there. And, and I had to learn how to like really quickly become a practice swimmer, <laughs> uh, which was, which was, um, something I think I, that's what I'm probably most proud of in my collegiate career is I think I wound up being a real workhorse in the pool, which was something I maybe didn't have to be as much in high school. Um, but yeah, I had a lot of injuries. Um, I, we had a coaching change at the end of my junior year and Carol Capitani came on board and she just, um, I always say if I had like gotten to swim another couple of years, I would have probably hopefully broken some of those best times because she just really brought out, she kind of knew how to coach the, um, she just had a lot of belief in me and I feel like she really kind of brought out the best in me. If anything, what would you have done differently to give yourself the opportunity to swim faster? That's a good question. Um, I probably wouldn't have been so in my head. It's kind of a vague answer, but you kind of know it when you're, when you're in it, right? Like you kind of, I think I was used to always and not in that, hopefully it doesn't sound cocky because it was a pretty small stage. I mean, Texas swimming is big, but it's still just, you know, age group swimming and 
Um, I was used to always winning, frankly. And I think when I wasn't anymore, instead of like using that to fuel me, I kind of went inward a little bit. Um, I remember at one point I had dealt with this back injury on and off, which still unfortunately plagues me <laughs> to this day. And um, I was in like the D final or something or the C final or something going into some, some, some meet at finals. And um, I didn't feel like I could listen to my music. I didn't feel like I could keep my headphones on because I thought this is the craziest thing to think. And I realize that now, but I thought that's embarrassing. You know, I'm not even in the A final. I don't deserve to listen to music and get pumped up. Um, which breaks my heart for a little like 19 year old spin to think that because that's obviously not, not true. Um, but I think I was just very in my head, very hard on myself. And if I could go back and change that, I think that would have made a big difference to sort of loosen up a little bit. Well, there was all, I'm sure you also had some pressure as going into college as the national high school record holder. How much did that also play into it? I think it played into it a fair amount. I mean, I remember when I broke that record, I broke a woman named Caroline Bruce's record, who was a 2004 Olympian, I think. Um, and everybody else, it was a private school record. So everybody else, like the 100 Butterfly or the 100 Backstroke or whatever, they had all gone on. It was like Natalie Coughlin and Kathleen Hersey. They all gone on to become Olympians. Um, and so when I broke that record, I, I kind of felt like it, it did feel it was a great feeling. But I also felt this immense pressure of like, wow, literally every other name on this list you know, has gone on to, to, you know, to these goals. Um, you know, I have to do that now too. And of course it was, I always wanted to, but I think, um, I think, yeah, I think there was some pressure in that for sure. Um, just looking to the present and you said you always identify as a swimmer. Do you still get in the pool, do some laps? I do. I go on and off with it. Um, so I live in LA and there's an awesome master's team out there, Southern California aquatics. And, um, pre COVID, I was sort of in and out. I pay my membership. I, those 5am wake ups are so hard as you both know. <laughs> um, and with work and like tra LA traffic, it's always like, you're never, I'm never going to make it after like work. I mean, after work or anything. So I'm always like, Oh, I got to get up in the morning and do it. But I did have a good year there in like 2016 or 17, where I made some great friends and actually went to master's nationals and just sort of really kind of rediscovered a, a love for the sport. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I haven't been in the water since the pandemic, frankly, at all. <laughs> um, but I think I'll, I think it'll always be something that, that um, it's, there's something, as you both know about the water, it's just like, it's just a form of meditation almost when you've been in the water almost more than you've been on land, especially in your childhood, there's something so comforting about it. And most people, when they retire from elite swimming, they pick up some other kind of exercise outlet. Do you, you know, do CrossFit? Do you get on a, a bike and do spin class or is it really just swimming? That's all you do. You know, I, um, I love, I love the stationary bike. Um, I have a Peloton, um, which was like a pre pandemic Christmas gift that ended up being like very prescient, <laughs> um, to have in the home, which I'm very, very grateful to have. Um, before that I would uh, go to a lot of flywheel classes. Um, I love, I love the bike because it kind of has that swimming thing of like, you know, it has the numbers, you can track your RPM and your power and you can compete with people. I find it very hard to motivate myself. Um, it's not a great quality, but like to go for a jog or something for me is, um, I really need someone to be like screaming at me <laughs> or to like see someone's stats next to me to try to, uh, to race them. So, yeah. <laughs> So on Twitter, you said that you are a truffle oil aficionado. What is your favorite meal to make using truffle oil? Oh, I love these questions. Um, <laughs> my dad makes an amazing, um, like a, I guess it's like a white mushroom risotto with, with truffle oil, um, which is just like heavenly. <laughs> so good. I'll eat truffles on anything though, or truffles or truffle oil and eggs or whatever. I'm not like rolling in dough to have like a bunch of truffle oil in my <laughs> kitchen at all times, but if I can splurge, totally. <laughs> what other meals do you enjoy eating or cooking for that matter? Um, gosh, I, you know, I'm not the best cook. I am when you get into, um, you know, when I was swimming and I was at Texas, I lived with four of my best friends and we would always kind of laugh because they would make these amazing meals and I would like either eat with their leftovers or like order in or something. Um, but I've been trying to experiment a little bit. I've been really into, um, salmon and swordfish and, you know, 
doing the whole lean, lean fish thing. But I think the pandemic has probably made us all have to start experimenting with recipes. <laughs> yeah, everybody turns into a cook. You know, you have to find something to, to entertain yourself at home. Totally. Well, this has been such a great time spent with you, Spin. I've just really enjoyed catching up with you and, and to know that you've um, been doing very well for yourself out there in Hollywood. I am very excited to watch your episode of FBI Most Wanted. I've, I've already marked it on my calendar, episode <laughs> four. I am, everything is set aside. I'm gonna be sitting down and watching it, not just watching on my DVR, I'm gonna watch it live. And, oh and my gosh, I hope I, I know that. Out. I know the writer of this show. <laughs> That is very kind. I really appreciate you both. This has been, um, I feel like a little queen for a day. So thank you both for having me on and, and please keep churning out the episodes. I'm a big fan now, so. That's good to hear. All right, thank you everybody else for watching as well. And as you see from SPIN, it's not just about the destination, it's also about the journey. We'll see you next time.